What's going on, everybody? Welcome into the Wednesday, April 24th, 2024 edition of the Daily Energy News Beat Stand Up. Here are today's top headlines. First up, California considers suing Exxon over plastic pollution. Absolutely unbelievable. Short news segment. We'll dive then really right into what happened with the oil and gas markets. We did see um, oil and gas prices rise, specifically on the crude oil side, by the uh, about a dollar. We will go ahead then and cover quickly what the API crude oil guesstimate will be. But then we've also got four earnings lined up. I want to look at Tesla absolutely has a horrendous earnings call. We'll uh, look at the results of that. Halliburton posts higher than expected um, quarterly revenue and the highest they have in over a decade now. That's on the oil field services side. And then we'll finish specifically talking about Matador and EQT earnings, which dropped really just as the bell closed here. So guys, Great episode. I am rocking a solo show today. Stu is out on assignment. So I'm going to go ahead and just kick us off. California considers suing Exxon over plastic pollution. I'm reading straight from the article here. California is close to completing a two-year investigation into Exxon on allegations of plastic pollution. Once that concludes, the state will then decide whether or not to sue the super major for polluting or not. Okay, according to the state of California, the company, a.k.a. ExxonMobil, has been involved in a, quote, half-century campaign of deception and perpetuating myths around recycling. Absolutely unbelievable. Here's the quote from California's uh, Attorney General Rob Bonta. We are soon going to be ready to, uh, we are, excuse me, we are going, we are soon going to be ready to get to a decision based on all our investigations in the coming month. The lies and deceits Exxon used to cover up the truth about non-recyclable plastic is, well, documented it's absolutely unbelievable what's going on right now exxon is spearheading back and basically saying this is diversion from the original problem which really is pollution exxon's head of product solution karen mckee told the financial times the issue is pollution the issue is not plastic this is a interesting side angle they're trying to get at now now all of a sudden plastic is emissions which we can have our issues with too much plastic or whatever and and i'm not going to get into an argument weather on that but the fact is that you they're trying to circumvent what they can't already prove it's it's pretty hilarious. It's it's pretty hilarious. I feel sorry for Exxon. You know, they're not even the California company, which is hilarious. They are, they, you know, if anybody, Chevron is based in San Ramon right there. So you wonder why they're going after Exxon and not Chevron. Maybe it's because Chevron pays taxes in their state. And we might as well piss somebody else off and not the person in our own. So it's very interesting what's going on here. But um, it's an absolutely um, a pretty crazy story. You know, again, California is going to do what California is going to do. You know, a two year investigation. Absolutely unbelievable. Not really else much else on the news front uh, with, with Stu being out. We'll leave some of the geopolitical stuff a um, little quiet on the Western front when it comes to what's going on in the Middle East right now. So we'll take that as a win. We'll go ahead and move over to the finance side. But before we do that, guys, I'll quickly go ahead and just pay the bills here. As always, thanks for checking us out. www.energynewsbeat.com, the best place for all your energy and oil and gas news. Stu and the team do a tremendous job making sure that website stays up to speed. Everything you need to know to be at the tip of the spear when it comes to the energy and the oil and gas business hit the description below all the links to the articles you can find us um even timestamps. um check out dashboard energy newsbeat.com data news combo again www.energynewsbeat.com you know from from an overall market standpoint we saw the s&p 500 actually have a great day today up about 1.2 percentage point nasdaq doing a little bit better even without tesla earnings 1.5 percentage increase we did see a uh, the the two year yields drop about three quarters of a percentage point. Ten year yields stay he- a hold fairly flat, only down about a tenth of a percentage point. Dollar index wipes about a half a percentage off of it, and we did see uh, Bitcoin stay steady about sixty six thousand dollars. Crude oil up about one point eight percentage points, um, mainly as the the move in where people are looking at 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 the dollar shifts away from geopolitical and what's going on in the Middle East to really here at home. Again, the dollar index really falling to its lowest level in over a week, which is really where you're going to see that increase. Obviously, there's an inverse correlation between the dollar index and what's going on in in, in oil prices. Uh, S&P Global kind of showed some some 
slow business activity going on in April. Uh, basically, that marker came in about at a four month low on a much weaker demand, and with that chipper and with that cheaper greenback, um, as so called it is called all around, you're going to go ahead and see um, some of that demand shift internationally, which is going to help obviously crude oil prices. Um, great quote from Andrew Lipow here in the article: "The market has been under pressure from little to no growth out of this eurozone, so anything showing improvement should." be supportive. We also did see a fairly positive API guesstimate um, on crude oil inventory reserves. As you guys listen to this um, here this morning at about 9.30, uh, 10.30, or excuse me, 9.30 a.m., you'll see crude oil inventories. Guesstimate out of the API is about a 3.2 million barrel draw, which is up from their forecast of 1.8 million. So this would set an interesting trend of a, of a draw here. So we'll see if that's a, either a confirming or deny. I've got four earnings I want to cover. Um, Tesla, Absolutely getting crushed. First off, you know, Tesla reports biggest revenue slide since 2012 and announces a renewed push for affordable models. So to give you guys a heads up here, Tesla reported about a 9% drop in revenue in the first quarter, their steepest year over year decline since 2012. Um, that corresponds uh, to about a stock price that's down more than 40% year over uh, year, uh, since the beginning of the year, which absolutely brings their, which is absolutely crazy considering where their valuation was to where that is now. I want to go ahead and bring up this, this article, Ms. Producer, if you don't mind showing up Tesla quarterly revenues by segment, you can see all categories, um, or, or excuse me, you can see all categories there, but mainly total automotive revenues take a big hit. Services and energy generation plus storage actually stay uh, relatively the same. We saw Tesla's automotive revenue declined seven or thirteen percent relative. So you can see there's actually a little bit of growth in the services and the energy generation, which is super interesting. Tesla fans not too happy right now. The Tesla went ahead and sent it its shareholder deck that volume growth rate may be notably lower than the growth rate it achieved in 2023, which is interesting on the backs of the fact they didn't already hit their revenue. And now they're going to say it may possibly, possibly be lower. Who knows? Um, you know, they also did mention that they're really looking at, you know, affordable models, this quote unquote new vehicles, including more affordable models, be able to produce um, on the same quality manufacturing lines. So, I mean, it's clear with the in, as we've seen with the Chinese EVs, as they've come into the market and tried to lower that price down, it's either a race to the bottom on price or a race to the top. And I think Tesla's being smart and doing both. If I'm going to bet on anybody, it's Tesla. But I do think there are some rocky, rocky roads ahead. And it'll be interesting to see how they go about doing this. Um, as you can see, the quarterly net income, if you scroll down later in the article, we can also just toss that image up here. Tesla quarterly net income. They're pretty crazy um, in 2024 um, or, or in uh, in first quarter 2024. Um, so if if you want to talk about um, some of a, a reversion to the mean, you know, absolutely, absolutely unbelievable. Revenue came in as I, you know, they, it was a 9% drop in revenue. You know, they had about $27.1 billion in revenue um, uh, earlier in the year. Uh, in, the mor in the morning, we saw analysts expecting about a $22.3 billion, barrel, uh, billion um, dollar print. So, yeah, it, you know, I mean, well, what, what do you expect? Again, I think it's a race. It's going to be very interesting to see where Tesla goes. But I'm going to bet on anybody it's going to be Elon Musk figuring this out because um, he hasn't proved us wrong. Next, we'll move over to Halliburton. They go ahead and post highly quarterly revenue in over a decade. Um, reading straight from the article here, Halliburton posted its highly highest quarterly earnings in over a decade after bringing total revenues um, of about five point eight billion in the first quarter of twenty twenty four. That marks a two percent increase compared to the first quarter of twenty twenty three. Uh, net income sat at about six hundred six million, which is actually down compared to the first quarter of last year. But adjusted net income um, was actually up. Revenue was increased by twelve percent growth from the company's international sales. We we actually talked with Jeff Krimmel on a soon to be released um, deal spotlight specifically about this issue that international sales have continued to rise. It's one of the things that Schlumberger will probably tout when they go and how announce their earnings. And what they also go ahead and announce is that this was balanced by falling North American revenue down 8% year over year. What was interesting, they said, was this was a decline primarily driven by their lower pressure pumping services in U.S. land, along with lower wireline activity. Interesting. So, uh, now that means what does wireline mean? It probably means the you know we're seeing fracks come down, and we've known that for a little bit. So as the U.S. fracking and really the gas 
you know, side of the fracking market. We're seeing all of these companies lay down completions rigs. That's going to again impact because that's a you know it's a high margin service right there, and they're not cheap. Trust me. So Halberton, um, for all that being said, continues a record quarter. Good for everybody over at Halberton. We'll look for Schlumberger here later this week. Let's move to Matador. They go ahead and and just recently announced their first quarter earnings report. I'll kind of read you the the, the top headlines from them. They average production of about one hundred and forty nine thousand seven hundred and sixty boe per day. That works out to about 800 or 84,777 barrels of oil per day. So you can kind of see the split there. Net cash provided by operating activities, about $468 million adjusted free cash flow, about $26 million. Man, these people love to spend money on CapEx. CapEx in the first quarter came out to be about $350 million. Um, and midstream capital uh, was about $79 million. So you're talking about $420 million of capital. That's, boy, these people love, love to spend. Again, $468 million of, of net cash flow or uh, net cash provided by operating activities, which is a good metric of how much you're you're throwing around there. Um, super, super interesting. Um, I, you know, they also did see realized commodity prices of about two uh, a two dollar change relative to what they saw in the fourth quarter of 2023, and that's interesting. I, a lot of prices going up, so it's going to be very. We'll be interested to see there. Their their guidance was actually higher. Uh, for uh, capex at 385 than what it came in at, at 350 million dollars, and they did see a small, small production increase. So you know the the, the market will like that. Um, I do find it interesting though that they did um um they did see a drop of about 60 million in actual net income, which is a a a gap um rated accounting relative to um quarter over quarter, but it was up from 163 million a year ago. So, I mean, they continue to, to, to obviously people are seeing an issue with, 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 with what's going on in the Permian right now in terms of having to shut in and Waha gas uh, differentials. But I think companies are continuing to fight back. The next one we see EQT and I, and I want to point out a couple things here. I mean, obviously EQT being a natural gas generator, um, uh, natural gas um, company, it's going to, you're going to see a little bit of a hit. You know, they had about $1.1 billion um, of net cash provided by operating activities, $400 uh, million of free cash flow, um, and had about $650 million left on the balance sheet. Um, LOEs got down to about 10% or $0.10 cents per MCF, um, lower debt. Um, to about 5.7 billion that was uh down from 5.8 billion um they also went ahead and and uh did some stuff down there in the Texas LNG um by upsizing their their uh liquefaction capacity from 0.5 million tons per annum to 2 um they went ahead and closed on that Equitrans midstream deal um and they did do an they 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 had an agreement to sell about 40% of their non-operating natural gas assets for about a 1.1 billion dollars you know, so I mean, and I mean, being a natural gas producer, guys, we already know they're 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 laying rigs down, or excuse me, they're laying frack rigs down. Uh, we we saw from Chesapeake and Southwestern them announcing the same thing. Um, I I always like to again go ahead and just look at the 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 net income, um, specifically for um. Um, the 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 year over year. So to give you guys an idea, about last year they had about one point two million, one point two billion in adjusted EBITDA. Um, for the 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 quarter, and we saw um in twenty twenty four we saw about one point only one point oh one uh billion of adjusted EBITDA. So you're seeing about a drop of about two hundred uh million there. And then from a from from the free cash flow perspective, um, and then the last three months of twenty twenty or last three months for uh. First quarter 2023, excuse me, 773 million of free cash flow. It, as we stand today, is 401. So about a drop of uh, about 30%. So you can see 30, 40%. You can see where gas prices are really hitting them in there. They do a really good job of, um, of of hedging, I think their net backs. They they have them in here. I want to. I had them and I and I just lost them. I think their net backs put them about um, average real life pricing about you know three dollars and twenty two cents. So that's that's pretty good considering you're going to come in and have to do a lot of hedging. Obviously, the higher that price um, needs to be, their total unit per operating cost about a dollar thirty six. So they're about a fifty percent margin right now, which isn't terrible. Um, but you know, obviously, with higher gas prices, we're going to yield some. Uh, some higher revenue. So you can just kind of see what low natural gas price is doing. It's going to be interesting to see when they can get this Equitrans midstream closed. 
Um, but long show today, guys, on the finance side. We'll let you get out of there. It's earnings season. What can you expect? Appreciate everybody checking us out here on the World's Greatest Podcast, www.energynewsbeat.com for all your news. I'm Michael Tanner. We'll see you tomorrow, folks.